Now that Grambling has hired Mickey Joseph as their new head coach, all eyes should turn to the Tigers' passing attack. Oh, yeah, it's locked on HBCU. Play my music. You are locked on HBCU, your daily podcast covering HBCU sports. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, family? Welcome back to another episode of the Locked On HBCU Podcast, your number one daily one-stop shop for everything HBCU athletics, Monday through Friday, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And I, of course, am Darian Gray, a.k.a. the Mouth of the South, Texas Southern alum and former TSU Herald Sports editor and current contributing writer at USA Today's Saints Wire. Thank you for going on this journey with me. Make it locked on HBCU, your first listen of the day, every day. And remember, just because the mic cuts off does not mean that the journey is over. It just means it's time to follow me on Twitter at South Exclusives. Starts with an S and ends with an S. I want to say thank you and apologize at the same time to all of my audio listeners because yesterday's episode didn't get posted until a 1150 because i forgot to press publish so thank you for your patience and my apologies for the delay but today's episode you're going to want to stay throughout the whole time and i know that i often press this but i genuinely believe that i have three lead segments but i can only have one right that's how good and how important i find each one of the three segments we'll talk about today and it's just on my execution because the show ideas are there so don't leave stay through segment three i promise you you will not regret it we wrap up with kamari young's underrated impact on the celebration bowl he's a guy who's not going to get discussed a lot but he was extremely important to famu success prior to that is fred mcnair going to texas southern As an alum, I want to know. But as a sports analyst, I find this whole situation very interesting, confusing, and frustrating all at the same time. But prior to all of that, one team that knows who their coach is, and that's the Grambling Tigers, because because they have hired Mickey Joseph, former University of Nebraska interim head coach, former Grambling wide receiver coach, and overall – When you look at Joseph, you see he has ties to the state and you see he has ties to the school. And those are two things that I think are oftentimes very important in hiring. I was talking to Mason Smith, SI, friend of the show. He pointed this out as a trend. I've noticed it as a one-off case each individual time. But this is something that we often see. Does he check the box of HBCU ties? Does he check the box of local ties, right? Or maybe just state ties. Didn't even have to be within the city, just the state. It's usually one or the other. Mickey Joseph has both. He's no stranger to Grambling, and he's no stranger to the state of Louisiana. He's a Marrero, Louisiana native, right? But now that Mickey Joseph is the Grambling state head coach, I'm looking at the passing attack because he's made his name as a wide receiver coach. And you would probably say that his crown jewel, his his favorite time, probably the thing that makes him look the best is the 2019 LSU Tigers. You had Justin Jefferson, Jamar Chase, Terrace Marshall, right? And I don't want you to think that because specifically Chase and Jefferson, who get the majority of the attention, were great in 2019 and they went into the league and they were great immediately, means that they were great in college immediately. There was development of those players. And I think that the wide receiver coach deserves a little bit of the uh, of the praise for that because, yes, they did the work by themselves, But the wide receiver coach had to give them a little something. So let's give him a little some of the credit as well. The next reason I want to watch for that passing attack is reportedly the offensive coordinator is going to be Eric Dooley. And we all know that Dooley knows how to get offense. And you may say the last two years should make me, Darian Gray, stop saying that because he struggled at Southern. But here's the thing. If he's going to be the offensive coordinator at Grambling, he already has a leg up on what he had at Southern because he has a quarterback. He didn't have that at Southern the last two years. And if you want to blame him for not being able to identify the quarterback, go ahead. 
but he don't have to identify here because the quarterback is there. It's Miles Crawley. No need to identify. Don't no need to pick a guy. He's there and he's good. So yes, he already has a leg up, and I still trust his offensive acumen, right? And matter of fact, when he was at Grambling the last time, they had a dangerous offense. Ironically, both him, Dooley, and then also Joseph were on this staff together. So to me, this is the thing to watch. And he has, sorry, there's so many he's, I want to make sure I'm talking about the right guy and make it clear I'm talking about the right guy. Joseph has a history of being a recruiter, right? He was named the rival's top 25 recruiter one year. One reason I love coaches with recruiting backgrounds is because I now trust that their experience in a multitude of other areas, right? Because whether you're recruiting Power 5, Group of 5, FCS, D2, right, in, uh, NAIA, whatever, if you have experience recruiting, that translates because you know how to make connections. It's not about, oh, I know how to do this on a Power 5 level. I'm sure there's different dynamics to recruiting on each subdivision. I'm sure of that. But if you know how to recruit and you're on the top 25 level of recruiters, then trust and believe that translating is going to happen. It's almost like the argument between greats and eras. And I'm sure you've heard this spoken before. Every great or most great players in an era could play in another era because they're great. They have the ability to translate. They have the ability to adapt. That's probably the best thing. They say that greats can play in multiple eras because they have the ability to adapt to the times. And I think that if you're a great recruiter, you can adapt to the subdivision. So I think that that's something that's important to watch. He's a wide receiver coach. If you bring Dooley in, who also has a strong offensive background, I immediately have to watch their ability to throw the ball. But then he's also a recruiter, so I believe in them to be able to recruit more talent to be able to throw the ball. This is extremely interesting to me. And one of the reasons that it's interesting to me and probably not interesting to most people, this is this is a personal thing and probably other Texas Southern either alums or people who have been paying attention to the Texas Southern situation is that Mickey Joseph was one of the guys who was interviewed for the TSU job. Obviously it's not going to be him, but the name that's been connected to the Tigers of Texas Southern very frequently as of late is Fred McNair could possibly fill in the last vacancy in the SWAC, create another vacancy in the SWAC. Let's look at that on the next episode of Dragon Ball Z. No, I'm joking. Uh, my brother's going to love that one though. But let's look at that as we continue today's episode of Locked On HBCU. Today's episode is brought to you by eBay Motors. And eBay Motors is perfect for if you need to fix up your car, right? Let's say that you just got into an accident. Or let's just say things are going bad. Maybe you have cosmetic issues. Maybe you have actual functioning issues, right? You can get a part, whether that's a new bumper, new uh alternator right a new starter whatever whatever may be the problem for you you can get that on ebay motors they have over 120 million parts which means i know that they have the part for your car in order to ensure that you put your car into the my garage section so let's say you have a 2007 nissan Sentra, right you're going to put that into the my garage section and all the parts that come up are going to be fitted for your car eBay guarantee fit means that if it's not fitted for your car, you get your money back, no questions asked. But you ain't going to be asking no questions because it's going to fit for your car. It's simple. Go to ebaymotors.com. That's ebaymotors.com. Whether you need to fix your car cosmetically or functioning, eBay Motors, let's ride. As we continue rolling on today's episode of Locked on HBCU, I appreciate you for making this your first listen of the day every day as soon as I'm done talking. doesn't matter what time you're listening to me, right? You could listen to it right when it drops at 5 a.m. or you could be listening right before the next one drops at 5 a.m. the next day. doesn't matter. You will be checking out Locked on Sports today after this because they will have a show going. The first ever 24-7, but it won't be the last 24-7 podcast stream. But remember that Locked On did it first. Now, as we move forward, we're looking at Fred McNair. This whole Fred McNair situation at Texas Southern is strange to me. It's just strange because I can't get a beat on what to believe. I can't quite grasp which report I should hold as higher than the next report. But it just seems like there's so much conflict between the two. And because of that conflict, I feel absolutely no confidence to predict what's going to happen. 
I really don't. And I was hoping to come into this week. I, I think I said this on Friday's episode. I was hoping to come into this week and say that Fred McNair was the Texas Southern head coach. I was hoping to do that. That was supposed to be the lead segment. Texas Southern or Texas Southern steals Fred McNair from Alcorn. Whoa, that was going to be crazy. It was supposed to be the follow up to the celebration bowl. Obviously, obviously, that's not the case. Obviously, that's not what has happened. But with the confusion I'm feeling, I almost would rather just know he's going to Alcorn, right? Like, like just give me something. I'd rather feel either way confidently than feel in the spot that I'm at right now. Because do you have a guess on what's going to happen? And do you feel confident in that guess, right? Like, I have a guess. I think he's going to go to TSU. I think that Fred McNair is going to be the Texas Southern head coach. But I feel more conviction in the word think than I do Texas Southern. I feel more confidence saying think than I do saying will be. I, I can't even say the statement. I, I couldn't even begin to tell you Fred McNair will be the next Texas Southern head coach. That's my prediction. I, that, that sentence feels wrong coming out of my mouth because I don't feel that way. I don't feel that conviction. Let me say that. I feel that way, but I don't feel the conviction. And there's a vast difference between those two feelings. Um, this situation is strange to me because every time I feel like I hear something good about TSU, they tell me to wait. So those conflicting reports are the thing that make me say, okay, so what, what, what is, what's the truth? Because a while ago, the TSU and Fred McNair have been connected, I want to say since mid-November. We're now in mid-December. We're going on about a month of Fred McNair and Texas Southern being connected. And when he was first connected to the school, it was shut down immediately. Nah, not happening. So much so that I came on and I named the most interesting candidates for TSU's job. And I named him and I said, you know, I don't think that's going to happen. I think it's a long shot. I think he's going to stay out there at Alcorn. And I, as you can see, as you can hear, I have a certain level of just restraint when I'm speaking, a certain level of hesitance when I'm speaking. And that's the product of herky jerky reports. First, I hear, yep, it's going to happen. Then it's not, it's not going to happen. Now it's, he, he's not interested. Then he was, it's, it's, it's so much. Here's my thing. There was a report that he sent out a text message to all corn players that he's still the head coach in radio silence. And the reason I hate the radio silence after that is because the text message doesn't shut down anything. I think it only shuts down on surface level. And because I'm a Texas Southern alum, I'm not looking surface level. I'm digging a little bit deeper because to me, that's not committal. To me, there's a big difference between I'm still the all corn head coach and I will be the all corn head coach. Those are two different statements. It's the same thing as I think Fred McNair is going to be the Texas Southern head coach and saying that Fred McNair will be the Texas Southern head coach. That's my prediction. Those are two statements that sound very similar, but the conviction changes the message that is being sent out there, right? The thing that's frustrating to me about this Fred McNair to Texas Southern situation is that everything that I hear sounds like he's going to TSU. But as soon as it gets close, as soon as it feels like it's a foregone conclusion and we're just waiting for the next shoe to drop, the next report is, well, I don't know, right? Like that's the next report. TSU and him have a close, they're close on a deal. Hey, but you know, he sent out some text messages saying that he ain't gone yet. I, like, come on, what are we doing here? I hear that there's a meeting on the 15th. Last time I checked my calendar, the 15th was last week. I still don't know what's going on. This was supposed to be, the final shooter to confirm the coach's salary. Did you do it on Friday or not? Like that, that's, that's my thing. See, it's frustrating because everything about this says that Fred McNair is going to lose or leave Alcorn. Everything about this says Fred McNair is going to leave Alcorn and go to TSU. But as soon as we get close, then people want to come up with little reports saying, well, not quite. It's close, but no cigar. He might go back to Alcorn. He's sending out messages. The thing about those text messages is me, I wouldn't send that message unless I was staying. 
but I also would have been way more committal with my language and I would have said I'm not going anywhere. So what should I believe? Should I believe the reports that says he's going to Texas Southern? Should I believe the reports that says Alcorn is on the table? I think he doesn't know yet. I think he's unsure. I think he's weighing his options. But when he's weighing his options and it goes radio silent, now I'm sitting here confused. Now I'm sitting, not even confused. I'm sitting here with more questions than I feel like I had a couple of weeks ago. Things were way different when I just thought he was a long shot. Now he feels like he's a close, a close hire that I'm just waiting for it to happen, but it just keeps not happening. It keeps not happening. Uh, so we'll see what happens. Hopefully by the end of the week, I can say that Fred McNair is the coach somewhere. If he is, and here's the other thing that makes me feel like it's going to happen. I've been following a, uh, a, uh, a, a reporter, a sports director in Mississippi on, on the news. I can't remember his name right now, but the thing that's got me, is that they have now started pointing out potential candidates to replace Fred McNair. I think that those at Alcorn know it's very real that they could lose him. I think they know it's very real that they could lose him. And you know what? Early signing day is tomorrow. It's tomorrow. So any of those Alcorn guys who don't leave in the portal would then be available in the spring if they wanted to go to TSU. Then they would be able to go in February, but they wouldn't have left yet. They could still enter the portal after tomorrow, but you couldn't join your new team on December 20th. That's the only difference, right? So things are up in the air. And don't think that my hesitancy, don't think that my, my reluctancy is going to be around for long. Next time I talk about this, I expect to have a concrete solution on what Fred McNair is going to do. I'll keep all the hesitancy off of the podcast. But as we continue... Kamara Young, there's no hesitancy. There's no reluctancy. I can tell you with a straight face, Kamara Young may be the most underappreciated part of FAMU's victory on Saturday, and I'll break down why his impact was so important as we continue with Locked On HBCU. As we're wrapping up today's episode of Locked on HBCU, I appreciate you for making this your first listen of the day every day, making it all the way to segment three. And I thank you two times for that. Thank you. Thank you. And like I told you, I feel like I have three lead segments and now we're on the third one of the triumvirate. And this is had Mickey Joseph. You've had Fred McNair. And now we're going to go to Kamari Young. So we're highlighting three people, but this is the first player that we're going to do after two coaches in the first two segments. Kamari Young's impact on the Celebration Bowl, I feel, is so underrated. And I understand everybody can't get spotlighted. Everybody can't be showcased. Everybody doesn't have a moment that you want to highlight. But to me, Kamari Young had three big-time moments in this game that are going to fly under the radar. So let's look at his final stat line. Three catches, 78 yards, and there was no touchdowns, and it wasn't anything really flashy. And I think that's why people are going to just pass it by. Because those three for 78, they were big time, but it's not 100 yards. And you know how people are about certain landmarks. It's not 100 yards. And then also there's no touchdowns to go with it. But let me tell you something. Every single one of Kamari Young's catches was extremely impactful to the game. On yesterday's episode, we looked at Kelvin Dean and his offensive MVP performance and why he was a surprise. I don't think that surprise is an applicable adjective when you're looking at the performance of Young, though. Like, that's not that's not something that I would say. The reason I wouldn't say that is because he's got yards. He's had his 78 yards is his season high, but he's had over 50 twice, uh, over 60 two more times. Right. So he's been in the 50 to 59 range twice and in 60 to 69 two more times. But heck, like, forget the 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 each game. He's the third leading receiver on the team. Like, getting yards, him being the second leading receiver in the game, is of no surprise. He's a tight end, so you know he's going to catch the ball. It's not like Dean, who's a running back, and his receiving being the standout factor for him was surprising. Like, none of that. Nothing about this should surprise you, in my opinion. But it's just extremely impactful. The reason I bring up Dean is for two reasons. One, I think that he overshadowed Young. I think that Kelvin Dean's performance is the reason why Kamari Young's performance 
is underrated or under discussed. It's probably not underrated, but it's under discussed. And the second reason I brought it up is because Dean actually stole Kamari's slot in yesterday's episode. So I like peeling the curtains back. I like just showing you guys what's happening in my mind before we get on to the air. So I already show prep when I know we have a big game. If, it, if we're talking about the game of the week, especially when it's the celebration boat, and I know I'm going to have the first episode of the week is going to be all about that. We're not even going to fit anything else in. It's going to be all about that. I start show prepping early. So I already knew if FAMU won, we were looking at the defense. And I looked at if Howard won, what I, I was going to talk about, their resiliency, their ability to bounce back. But I really did feel like FAMU was going to win, um, even after that 14 to nothing stretch. I just I just felt good. And I was going to talk about I – had, I had plans based on who was going to win the game. Kamari Young was in my original plans until Kevin Dean went ballistic in the fourth quarter. And then you know what? We adjust and we move on. And now we come back on the Tuesday episode and we talk about the Celebration Bowl some more because this is the HBCU Super Bowl. And we will look at this. We'll probably look at it tomorrow, too, to be honest with you. Um, But let's look at Young's plays, right? Because we've peaked, we looked the peak behind the, the curtain so we can look at the inner workings. But I think that Kamari Young was to fam use offense in the first half what Kelvin Dean was in the second half. Now, there was no points, and I know Dean had two touchdowns, so it's not a perfect parallel. But I say that because I think that Young was the catalyst to moving the ball in the first half. I think that Young was the key to some of the best offense. I think that, I think that honestly, even if you're looking at the totality of four quarters, Kamari Young was the catalyst to creating the best moments for FAMU, in my opinion. Right, The most important moments that created the momentum that swung the Rattlers' way. When you look at his last catch, and I remember this, it was going into the fourth quarter. It was the first play of the fourth quarter. It was fourth down, and I was thinking to myself during the commercial break, dang, where is Kamari Young? I feel like I haven't seen Kamari Young in a long time, and I hadn't because his first two catches were in the first quarter. We're now in the fourth quarter. I'm like, dang, I ain't seen Young in a while. And then they line up, and I say it to myself. It feels like Kamari Young should be here. He should be the guy who gets this ball, and he does, on one of the best passes that Jeremy Musa threw all day. It was a beautiful uh, tight window throw. It was a beautiful throw under pressure. He got hit as he threw the ball, and there was about three defenders, two over the top, one underneath. He fit it over the underneath defender, and then he had to give some props to Young because he had strong hands when he got contacted as soon as he made the catch. This was a phenomenal play on fourth down. And at that moment, it was 16 to 10 Howard. You're at the 40-yard line, I think the 39. If you give Howard the ball right there, I don't know if FAMU wins. I think that the, the momentum is different because you struggled a little bit in the third quarter and you open up the fourth quarter with a failed fourth down attempt. And now you're going to give Howard really good field position. And we've looked at what Howard was able to do when they had field position. That was either, well, everything was above the 40. That one would have been right there at the 39. But we've seen what they've been able to do and how they were able to drive in the FAMU territory when they didn't have far to go. So now you're giving them a great field or starting field position. But it didn't matter because Kamari Young did. And we're not going to look at the impact of what could have happened. Just understand that Kamari Young's catch at the beginning of the fourth quarter, his last one for about 20 yards, that was extremely important to swinging the momentum in the direction of the Rattlers and making sure that things didn't get worse, right? It's not going to show up on the positive, but it avoided a really big negative. Now, let's look at the first two that were in the first half. The, the second catch he has, so we're just going to work backwards. The second catch that he had was on a third down, and it was another really well-placed ball where the defender was on Kamari's right shoulder, and Musa threw it leaning left so that it allowed Young to already be moving when he caught the ball, and he threw it about eight yards downfield. It was a third and nine, I believe, and that was what allowed him to get the extra couple of yards and make a little bit of a run to get the first down. Had he threw it right between his chest, he's likely getting tackled or he's going to have to make a really big break a tackle move. Right? So that allowed them to get the ball rolling. That's two got to have it catches. That's two got to have it catches one on third down, one on fourth down, the third down when you're going to punt because you're deep in your own territory. And on the fourth down, when you'd be giving them the ball back, near midfield those are two gotta have it plays and you went to kamari young the first catch he had 
was, I think that was the first catch. Yeah, this was the first catch that he had. 44-yard catch. That should have been a five-yard catch. He broke that tackle, and he ran the ball down the field for another 39 yards, right? Like, this was a ridiculous play where he didn't move extremely fast, but I saw him kicking into a little bit of a gear that got him away from one of the defenders, and it wasn't until the defensive back from the other side came to chase him down. But that put the ball at the 14. That put the ball in the red zone. It didn't lead to points. I think that's the problem is that some of these plays didn't lead to points. So now people aren't as impressed. It doesn't seem as pivotal because of what they did after the fact. But this is a third down catch that at the worst helped with some field position because you have been kicking from deeper in your own field, in your own uh, part of the field, right? Then you had a 44-yard pass that got him into the 14. Like I mean, like got him into the red zone. They just got a goal line stand there. And then you had another one that was on fourth down, and I really think kept a bad situation from happening with giving Howard the ball at the 40. This was this was a very impactful game, but because there was no touchdowns, because things weren't overly flashy, maybe that 44-yard catch would be one that is on the highlight when you're looking at the highlights of the game. But other than that, maybe not. You have big situational plays. You have big overall yardage plays. And if no matter what metric you're looking at, Kamari Young impacted the game and is going to fly under the radar because he's missing something. And that something is either the offensive MVP, he's missing leading the team in yards, or he's missing the touchdowns. But none of that matters. Kamari Young was extremely impactful to this FAMU Rattler Celebration Bowl victory. And we have to make sure that we highlight that. And that's what I'm here for. Now, in tomorrow's episode, speaking of the Celebration Bowl, I don't know why CB3 be throwing as classic. On the same day as the Celebration Bowl, poor planning, poor planning. And we're going to look at why that's poor planning on tomorrow's episode. But in the meantime, in between time, until the next time that we hear each other family, you can follow me on Twitter at South Exclusives. Until the next time that we hear each other family, take care, stay blessed. Peace.